if you figure out a way to have a point of difference that is so deep that none of your peers in your market are doing exactly what you do, what happens when they come across somebody that needs that service? They send them to you. Episode 123. This is the Business of Architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Welcome back, Architect Nation, to the business of architecture. It's good to have you here. Once again, thank you for honoring us with your time. And thank you for being part of this movement. You know, when I started this podcast, shoot, it's been over two years ago now. We've interviewed over 100 guests. There really was nothing like this out there in the marketplace to help architects understand how to celebrate running a good business, how to celebrate being a great entrepreneur. And, you know, right now, things have started to change. There's my buddy Mark LePage is fighting an excellent battle over there on Entrepreneur Architect. And thank you for joining me here at the Business of Architecture and really caring about this because I truly feel that this is a mission and you're part of this. As you listen, as you learn how to run a better business, you're going to be able to create better cities. You're going to be able to create better architecture. Just a quick reminder, the Business of Architecture Summit is coming up and hopefully you've already booked your ticket for that. Whether you own a firm or whether you one day plan to own your firm, this is going to be two solid days of business inspiration and motivation that can really move the needle for you professionally and in your career. So I highly encourage you to go pick up your tickets. Don't miss that summit. You can grab your tickets at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash summit. Today I'm joined again. This is the second part of my interview with Sandra Becker. She is the principal founder of Becker Management, and she focuses on marketing and management for service professionals. We're going to talk with her about some very interesting things today regarding some new cutting-edge marketing methods that are out there in the new media space like video marketing, blogging, as well as kind of an overall strategy. We kind of touched on that on our last episode. Sandra has degrees in physiology from McGill University and, interestingly enough, a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from McGill University. So she's uniquely suited to help architects in their quest to develop new business and develop their image. So, Sandra, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Enoch. Good to be here. <laughs> Thanks for joining us from Toronto. I always like to bring in other people from outside the U.S. because we truly do have an international listenership and it's great to have you know, someone from Canada representing. Well, I went through your website. I was really impressed with uh, the geograph geographic breadth of your guests. Yeah, I saw Australia. And I don't remember. They, they were all over the place. It's, it really helps to bring in different points of view. Absolutely, I agree. And it is so interesting that when a lot of the comments we get on the show are from listeners, Sandra, and you, you've experienced this as well, people are surprised. Wow, it's amazing that, you know, people in... Uh, you know, England are suffering from the same things that I suffer from over here. Or Australians will write and say, man, you know, people in the States are talking about the same challenges that we're having here as a business. So I, I think it's not, yeah. we're not as, as alone as we think we are. That's right. Sandra, we, we talked about discussing the, the four P's of marketing and your own particular take. Now, the four P's of marketing, for those who don't know, if you've ever, you know, if you have an MBA or if you, you have a degree in marketing, uh, the four P's, I think um, Mr. Kotler came up with those. I'm not quite sure, but I know it's mentioned in his book, which is sort of the, the tome on marketing. Um, and I'm not quite sure the title of it, but I'll put it in the show notes. But those those four P's are product, place, promo, and price. Let's talk a little bit about that, Sandra. Just this is more of a, a high level conversation about marketing and about positioning a firm. You know, what does that mean for an architecture firm? And what's your own spin on that? 
Um, sure. Okay. So product, you know, product would be the service that you offer. So in, in a professional, the context of a professional service, um, it's not a physical thing. It's not the building. It's the service that you render. That's the product. Um, the price is your fees and promotion basically would be any way that you, any, any way that you get the word out on your on your business because in professional practice, it's not traditional marketing. Even if the most important thing that you do is send, you know, email, email messages out to get meetings. And then you have uh, business presentations to, to generate projects. That's your promotion. Okay. And place, um, place would be the place where you render your, your product. So I, at the end of the day, I don't think the four P's are a great way of directing the marketing plan for a professional practice. And I thought about it and I, and I have two P's that I'd like to replace the four P's with for architects. That, that is wonderful so. because I'd like to, I'd like to take away from the <laughs> academic, you know, uh, the four, yeah. the four P's were actually developed originally. I just looked this up on uh, Wikipedia to set the record straight by E. Jerome McCarthy proposed four P classification in 1960. So this is sort of, you know, uh, quite a while ago. And then uh, the gentleman, Philip Kotler, who wrote kind of the the Bible on marketing that everyone who goes through marketing school, he wrote Marketing and Introduction, Marketing Management. He has tons of books that are, you know, kind of textbooks. So I would love, I'd love, Sandra, if you can just say, okay, let's let's forget about the four Ps. From my experience on the ground, there's only two Ps or maybe there's two Ps. These are, these are what they are. Go tell us about those. Okay, I have two new P's, right? <laughs> Put aside the others. <laughs> and I and this is kind of hot off the press because I just thought of this this morning. <laughs> um, this is the first one. <laughs> this, is a, this is an announcement. Well, my, <laughs> As always, my bringing you, we are, yeah, we are breaking news here at Business of Architecture. <laughs> My morning started earlier than yours. I'm in Toronto. That's true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Best thinking during yoga. <laughs> Love it. Um, okay. So <laughs> the first P, point of difference. And I talked about that a bit in our, in, our first, uh, in our first conversation. And the second P is partnership. And, you know, when, when we, um, we emailed each other about doing this talk, uh, you asked me what I was working on, and I told you it seems to be sort of a flood of clients going through changes, and I was helping them with, you know, managing the risk and, and actually the opportunity that came with those changes. I know a lot of those changes point in the direction of both of these Ps, okay? The, the partnership, what I mean by partnership, I kind of using it very loosely. Uh, partnership can be a legal, a legal partnership, right? Obviously running your architecture firm with a partner. Um, but it can also be any form of a partnership. You, you and I are partnering right now in doing this, this video, we're helping each other help both of our businesses. And in doing that, we're also helping architects and possibly other professions with, with their own thoughts about their marketing. So that's a partnership right there. Um, within within the pro architectural practice, there are very tight partnerships all the way up and down and across the org chart, the organizational chart. And when those partnerships are um, not aligned, that's when risk increases. Okay, so if the two part, let's say there are two partners at the top, and their vision for their practice is not exactly the same. They're going off in different directions. Um, they're not building in one straight line. There's sort of this, you know, like in concrete, you know, if there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a crease in there, then, you know, the building isn't as solid. Well, there you go. There's a little bit of something that's not as solid in your marketing. Um, so it's kind of a, a loose definition of partnership, but basically the two P's are point of difference and partnership. Well, those sound like incredibly important principles and mm -hmm. tell us a little bit i know we talked about point of difference a little bit in our in our last episode but let's touch on point of difference and why that is so powerful for a firm and how they can how they can develop that point of difference 
Well, and you know, in terms of this, this discussion about managing risk, point of difference can be your biggest tool. Um, if you figure out a way to have a point of difference that is so deep that none of your peers in your market are doing exactly what you do, what happens when they come across somebody that needs that service? They send them to you. So all of a sudden, what you've done is you've turned all the architects that you know, your classmates from school, anybody that you've worked with, anyone you can reach out to, conferences, whatever, you've turned them all into your referrers. So beyond the typical referrers, you know, that we talked about in the last segment, now you've turned your competition into your referrers. That's pretty profound. You've done something else. What you've done with a very deep point of difference is you've expanded your geography. So if nobody is doing exactly what I'm doing, I'm in Toronto. If, if a lot of people are doing what I'm doing in Toronto, I'm pretty much staying in Toronto. But if nobody's doing what I'm doing all across Canada, Canada's my oyster. Right. And what happens? OK, the, the, the building sector architects are very vulnerable to the ups and downs of the marketplace. I experienced this when I graduated from architecture school. I couldn't find a job to save my life. Honestly, it was it was a really, really hard recession at that time. And so architects know this and they know how they have to be ready for it. The ups and downs of the marketplace. And. If you secure for yourself a place in the market that is so different from what everybody else is doing, those blips, they're smaller, right? You've expanded your client base, you've expanded your geography, you've, you've really minimized your risk in doing that. Do you have any examples of people you've worked with, the firms that you know of that have this really great point of, <coughs> excuse me, difference? Uh, sure. I have a contact actually on Twitter and um, I can send you the link to this Enoch afterwards. She is an interior designer. She's a, she's a perfect example of what we're talking about here. She's an interior designer and she focuses on yachts. Yachts. That is the only thing that she does. So compare that to what most interior designers do. How many of them out there are saying, yeah, we have quite a bit of experience in yacht design. <laughs> so when they come across someone that needs a yacht, what are they going to do with them? They're going to send them to her. And, you know, she really is such a great example of what we're talking about here because, and I, I will, I, like I said, I will send you the link to this um, because knowing that her competitors who would have been her competitors, the other interior designers, not just in her market, but in international markets, aren't doing exactly what she's doing. She created uh, a Twitter chat that she does once a week on Twitter, and she advertises it on LinkedIn as well, and has a dedicated website for the Twitter chat, not her business, just for the Twitter chat. And what she does is she has speakers once a week that can uh, give advice to interior designers about different topics. So what she's doing is she's educating her competition because they're not really her competition. Is that something that you could, a resource you could send me so I can include it in the show notes? A absolutely. Okay. I apologize to our listeners. I've, I'm overcoming a cold here. And so I muted myself because I just had a huge coughing fit, but <clears throat> hopefully that'll that's gone. So yes, please send that to me. Let's talk a little bit about partnerships and what that means from a strategic standpoint. So you include it as one of your two P's. What is what does that mean, Sandra? Okay, so to strengthen the partnerships in 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 your own practice. Um the first thing is to make sure that right at the top, everything starts at the top, right? If you actually do have of a partner um, or more than one partner that you are all aligned in terms of the direction. If you're not aligned and you know you're not aligned to stop avoiding dealing with that. Uh, honestly, I have clients that have, and this is really such a common problem where the partners of a practice just don't agree. They don't agree 
about, you know, who they should be targeting or basic stuff like, you know, sh- uh, what kind of marketing they should be doing. Um, should they hire or not? Do they go to a different building? You know, I mean, very, very basic stuff to the big stuff. So the first thing is do some work with the partners and make sure that you're all aligned. Remember what it is that brought you together in the first place. Usually when I do some planning with, uh, with these kinds of situations, um, there was a very strong reason that these partners came together in the first place. And it's really a very healthy exercise to return to that place and build from it. Okay, so that's the first thing. You can't really do anything until you've done that. Because honestly, any other effort, there's always going to be that that elephant in the room, right? The, the pink elephant that nobody wants to talk about. And everyone sees it. <laughs> Just deal with it. <laughs> and so you can deal with it with a business retreat, with a strategic plan, um, bringing a consultant in into, um, into that kind of a situation is very helpful because uh, bringing consulting processes into a bit of an emotional, you know, uh, uh, problem between partners helps to remove the emotion from it and turn it into more of a an exercise that's very business oriented. And so you're just following the steps and it becomes easier to, to, to move forward. Um, also a consultant can bring objectivity, you know, so somebody who's, who's not aligned with one or the other and, and can help you work through these problems. Um, a business retreat can help. And okay. So beyond the partners at the top, there is partnership with all the other people in the firm. Um, some professional practices are set up in a way that is a bit informal. They don't have very, you know, like in corporations, very clear organize, organizational charts where you know who reports to who, um, you know, and having performance reviews and all of that. Um, I would recommend that they do. Okay, <laughs> so stop that. <laughs> Uh, be clear about who reports to who start setting up your performance reviews and that way you have more clarity about those partnerships okay so your firm will change from being a bit more flat to being a bit more um vertical and what that means is that is that clear enoch or should i explain with that uh explain yeah please explain flat versus vertical Okay, so let's say you let's say in the an example of a ten person firm, okay, and you have one principal and nine employees, every you know all kinds of different jobs, right? The architect, the receptionist, all, all kinds of technicians, and basically everyone just does whatever the principal says. So that's flat. So you've got the principal at the top, and everybody else, all the nine people at the bottom. That's the shape of the organization. If, on the other hand, the principal said, okay, you know what, my job would be easier if I had two people that directly reported to me, and those two people managed a group of, you know, three each, whatever, and my my numbers are totally wrong now, okay? <laughs> um, so let's say... Uh, let's say we did that. So then you would be going to more vertical. So you have the principal at the top, you have the two people in the middle, and then you have everyone else on the bottom. Now we're, in, we're now we're in a triangle. Okay, in this in this format of an organizational chart, your partnerships go deeper. <clears throat> the reason your partnerships go deeper is because you're dealing with less people. Each person is dealing with less people, and in doing that, you give each other more one-on-one time. And what happens in that one-on-one time? Relationships develop. In that one-on-one time, you're able to tell the person that you are reporting to where you struggle, where where do you need help, what can that person, how can that person mentor you, uh, how can they guide you, um, what kind of acknowledgement do you need, what motivates you, anything that will help you to do a better job, how do you learn, what is what is it about you that needs to be tapped into to make you better at your job. OK, you're not going to learn that when you're when you're fighting for the attention of the principal with nine other people. So deepening those partnerships, even within the own firm, all the way down the org chart, all the way across. And that's only one way of talking about partnerships. The other way I started with was you and I are this is an example of a partnership. So reaching out of the firm to your referral network, those are partnerships. 
and and on and so on and so on. So it sounds like you're. Are you? Sounds. This is my interpretation. Tell me if I'm understanding this correctly. You're referring to sure. developing a culture of partnership, a culture of thinking about the way to leverage every the group skills by having that attitude of partnering. Yes, it's exactly what I'm talking about, and through that, um, improving performance management throughout the firm, uh, improving attitude. So that the people in the firm become your sales ambassadors, right? They go out there. They're proud of where they work. They're excited. Their their needs are met. Excellent. Well, thank you for clarifying that, Sandra, and explaining mm-hmm. that. I just wanted to touch on in the the second half of this episode. Let's let's dive into video marketing a little bit. This is something mm-hmm. that we talked about last episode that you mentioned that you're seeing. Um, architects not using it as much as they could. So, and not just video marketing, but also blogging and video marketing. I noticed that you yes. do both of those really well. You you do a great blog, and you do some video marketing yourself. So, first question: <clears throat> What's special about video marketing? Why why is it important, and why should we care? Okay, so. So like we talked about in the last segment, video marketing is on the rise just because people are using YouTube more than they ever did. And well, if, you know, if people are there, examine whether or not your target market is among them. Uh, If that's the case, then it's worth exploring. But architects are uniquely positioned to turn video into something grand you know, more, more so than any other profession. It's a visual business. It's deeply emotional. If, if you know how to tap into it, uh, you know, there, there's nothing more exciting than, than a building that, that captures your aspirations and, you know, from, from home to, to, to grand architecture. That's a, a, about a, about a city. There's, you know, there's no shortage of material to turn that into something really grand through video. It's full of, it's full of visual, it's full of meaning, it's full of depth. And I mean, I, I studied architecture and I know that most architects out there are very passionate about what they do. So it's full of passion and really um, compare that to the other professions that are out there who are already using video more than architects. So we started talking about comparing lawyers to architects and lawyers don't have all that material that I just talked about. Right. <laughs> but they're, they're dealing with files. Okay. They, you know, the courts are kind of interesting, but you can't go there with your video, you know, so for, with your video marketing anyway. <laughs> so architects actually have um, a, a unique position to leverage video marketing. They're not doing it yet. I would say most of them are not not doing it yet. Um, so what can they do to, to, to leverage it? Um, I don't think that the answer is about necessarily going with a formal, uh, a f- formal video marketing strategy. That's not necessarily the answer for all architectural firms, okay? The answer to leverage this opportunity is going to depend on the unique circumstances of your firm. What are you trying to tell people? Who are you talking to? Why do you want to tell them that? How do you want to tell them that? Where do you want to tell them that? And the style of the video should match the culture of your firm. So if you go out with this really fancy, you know, very sort of stiff, okay, maybe fancy but not stiff video, and your firm has been has a, a history of 20 years of success because you're very down to earth, salt of the earth people, really easy to deal with, easy to talk to. Well, there's a disconnect. That might be a fantastic video, but it's not your video. So the greatest video for your firm is going to be the one that is most connected to the character of your firm and tells a visual story that's gripping and emotional. You know, you, you, you don't, you don't need to follow this. This is the same trap that we talked about earlier in, in the other segments with the, with the websites that have the predictable format where they have, you know, the big, 
the big portfolio picture and the standard one-liner in architectural uh, language that nobody understands. <laughs> you don't need to follow that format for website. Same thing goes for the video. The the standard format that's come that's emerging right now for professionals to use video, including architects, is to have you know the talking head going, "Oh, okay, this is what we do. This is my history." And it sounds a little bit like it's showing off. Nobody wants to watch that. Do you? I don't. And so if instead of taking that, that approach, the architect were to sit in, even if it was a building that wasn't something that he designed, let's say he, he's traveling and he's in a building that inspired him to go into architecture school in the first place. Okay. You know what? Take out that iPhone and do a video. That might be the very best video for you. It's not about turning it into this fancy technical exercise it's about getting to the heart of your profession and the heart of what makes your practice tick and sharing that with people that's exciting and that's emotional and that's what marketing is about do you have any tips for getting started with video marketing and being effective at it you need a plan you know um honestly it's it's the same thing as any other marketing adventure if you want to start a Facebook page, you want to start a LinkedIn group, you, you want to do direct mail, anything that you do in marketing, start with a plan. And the plan always starts at the very top with your objectives. What are you trying to achieve with this? Don't take that for granted because the, the slightest shift in your objectives changes the whole plan. And yes, I would say work with a consultant on it. <laughs> Now, the other thing that we were talking about was blogging. How can architects use blogging? Is that a useful? Do you see that as a, a really valid marketing investment for architects? You know what? I, I see blogging as part of the personal plan. Okay, so marketing falls for professional practices, for architectural practices. There are two streams for the marketing plan. Okay, there's the firm marketing plan, which includes all all of your foundational stuff, like your website, a brochure, you know, anything that anybody in the firm could use. That's the firm stuff. And then there's the personal marketing plan. And this would be um, based on each of the individuals that happen to be participating. Maybe not everyone is, but whoever is participating in the marketing plan um, should have their own personal marketing plan. The personal marketing plan, as far as I'm concerned, works best when it's tailored to the talents of the individual. So in some firms, they expect people to blog. Okay. And if somebody's not a good writer and they're shy about writing and, you know, in architecture, you might have that more than, more than in other fields. That's not the nature of the business. Um, or if they haven't been trained in how to write in a way that is um, more appealing to the audience of the blog. And so they know how to write to their architectural classmates. That's not the same thing as writing for a blog. Then they might not be good at it or they might not be comfortable with it. Okay. So I would say the first thing is you need to, you need to assign the blog to the people who are actually going to enjoy the activity. Otherwise they won't do it or they won't be good at it. The second thing is set them up to succeed. So give them, give them a plan. What is this blog about? Set it up, set it up in a way that it actually has direction. All the blogs carry a certain message. They're all directed at the same audience. That way it's set up to succeed. You know, you, what you're doing with your with your business actually is a very good example. You, you, you set up this um, format to do these videos and you're targeting the same audience with the same approach. And every time you do it, you're adding value and you're add, adding new information. But you're doing it in a consistent straight line. This is actually a very good example of, of that kind of planning that I'm talking about. Good job. <laughs> Thanks, Sandra. So uh, our, our architect listeners who are, you know, thinking, ah, maybe, maybe I should look into this, you know, blogging, you know, what in the world do they blog about? Any tips for that? Because I know that's a, that's hard a lot of times. It's just thinking about, well, what do I blog about? Because I do see a lot of, I do see some architects that have invested some time blogging, uh, but it seems like they're missing the mark sometimes in terms of the kind of messages they're putting out there. So from as a marketing professional, what are your tips for 
the content side of things and actually producing content that's going to be valuable to both the firm and the people that read it? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a really good question. And you know, if you, if you started blogging 20 years ago, it would have been so much easier to answer at that point, right? Because there weren't that many out there and anything you did would have been good. Almost anything you, you did, as long as you were adding value. Yep. Today, the answer changes entirely. Uh, there, there isn't a shortage of information. So answering questions, well, okay, maybe it would be helpful, but maybe not. Depends on, do you have a point of view? And so your point of view really becomes the most valuable piece of that blog. Thought leadership, saying something that maybe your competition is afraid to say, or um, being an advocate for something that is important to the end users of your building, um, you know, sort of getting people behind you to change something about your marketplace. Um, you know, th it, these are the things that push the most important blogs in our in our time ahead ahead of the curve. Think about what makes you react, and that's that's going to be the heart of what's going to make a great blog for your firm. Excellent. <laughs> well, Sandra, as we finish up here, any other thoughts that you wanted to leave with our listeners about uh, what you do as a professional or any other, any other things we left uncovered that you want to touch on? Um, well, I mean, the way I work with my clients is basically on two things. We work on marketing and management. And I think the, the thing that most, uh, architects and other professionals don't really give too much thought to before they delve into something like this is that marketing and management kind of need to flow from one to the other. Um, a lot of architects think about marketing as sitting in a silo and it's, you know, it's an independent activity in some practices. It's an administrative activity and it's uh, assigned to some junior people, you know, get out the proposals, that sort of thing. I, I would say um, consider thinking about shifting that to a strategic activity. Move it up the org chart all the way to the top and put it into that partnership mentality. The way that your marketing is going to work is if it's integrated with the way you manage your practice and your strategic plan for the practice. Marketing and management go together. They're not separate activities. Excellent. Well, Sandra, tell us again mm -hmm. how people can reach out to you and get a hold of you. And also, please tell me about who are the who are the clients that get the most benefit from working for you? Who is your ideal client in terms of an architecture practice? Just in case there's some out there listening, they fit that description, they feel some synergy with you. Perhaps, you know, perhaps we can make a match here. Thank you, Inek, for that. And you can visit our website at beckhor.ca, B-E-K-H-O-R.ca. All our social media links are there. And in terms of our target market, um, we work. We typically work with small to mid-sized firms, and that's from anything to, from marketing to management, uh, starting with the planning. So if you are thinking about engaging us or engaging other consultants, I would suggest starting at the beginning. Um, and even if you want to do some work before you're ready to do the, the marketing itself, bring the consultant in at that early stage. If you have a retreat coming up, if you have any um, independent planning that you're doing yourself, just so that you can have a discussion about the direction, <clears throat> the earlier, the better. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you, Sandra. It's been great it's having fun. you on the Business of Architecture today. Thank you. Great talking to you, Enoch. Okay. And that's a wrap for another show about the Business of Architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. Everybody knows that you just gotta do it anyway.
views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.